Welcome to Christchurch Purley and this online service for Sunday the 21st of March. And a particularly warm welcome if you're new. We'd love to get to know you and invite you to email us just to say hello or let us know if we can pray for you or help in any way. Turning our thoughts to the week gone by, let us come to a time of confession. Lord Jesus, you promised forgiveness for those who truly turn away from those sins that separate us from you. We lift those sins to you now. Lord, we receive your forgiveness where we have truly turned away and we turn to you. Amen. So today we're looking at, at Luke's distinctive gospel and the parable of the ten minas. And Lisa today will be helping us think about what it says about how Jesus is teaching us to put the gospel to work in our everyday lives. While they were listening to this, Jesus went on to tell them a parable, because he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king, and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten miners. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him, and sent a delegation after him to say, We don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money, in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your miner has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your miner has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your miner. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. 
I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in, and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in, and reaping what I did not sow? Why, then, didn't you put my money on deposit, so that when I came back I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, Take his miner away from him, and give it to the one who has ten miners. Sir, they said, he already has ten. He replied, I tell you that to every one who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine, who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here, and kill them in front of me. In the early James Bond films, you never had any doubt who James was working for, for Queen and Country. And to underline the point, the filmmakers made one film called On Her Majesty's Secret Service. James was always about the Queen's business. Now, if someone were watching you or watching me, would there be any doubt in their mind that we are working for King Jesus on His Majesty's business? Luke has placed Jesus' parable right here at the crescendo of Jesus' journey. Jesus had just radically transformed the life of Zacchaeus and having once again declared his mission and invitation that he's come to seek and to save the lost, not just Zacchaeus, but for all who are willing to be found by him and welcome him as Lord. But Luke also tells us why Jesus told this parable. You see, he was near Jerusalem and people were thinking the kingdom was going to appear at once. And why wouldn't they? Jesus was nearing the completion of his very long road trip from the north to the south and momentum had been building. Jesus had been teaching like no other rabbi with the words of eternal life and the wisdom of God. There'd been all the healings and the miracles, sight given to the man born blind, those with leprosy healed, a son, a brother raised from the dead. Now Jerusalem was just a few miles higher. Expectations were running to fever pitch that God's enemies, the Romans, would be overthrown and Jesus take the throne. The people were after a quick fix, a political solution. And they expected the kingdom of God to appear immediately. Jesus told them this parable to burst their bubble. He told a story of a different chain of events. Now this parable is not about money, but a man. And by the way, we're not to confuse this parable exclusive to Luke's gospel with the one that perhaps we're more familiar with in Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, where actually the talents are a far greater amount of money and they vary from one servant to another. In this story, here we hear of a man of noble birth who was made king, but whose enemies defied him. At the return of the king to his land, there was a reward of the king for some and the rebuke of the king for others. A story of a man going to a distant land to get a kingship. Well, that sounds strange to us, but actually it would have been a very familiar story to those first century hearers of Jesus, because this parable that Jesus told was in part based on a historical event. Herod Archelaus had to travel to Rome to actually get his kingship of Judea approved by the Romans before he could take up his title. However, and get this, Jews and Samaritans came together and sent a delegation 
behind him to Rome to protest and say that they did not want him to be their king. And in fact, although he was confirmed in his rule, he was never given kingship by the Romans. So the parable tells us that the man gave 10 of his servants, 10 minors, presumably one to each. And this minor was a moderate amount of money and the amount given did not vary, one to each. And the man said, do business with it. That's how several translations put it. In our translation, we heard, put it to work. And it says in verse 15, the one who says do business with it was made king. Jesus was speaking about himself. And yes, when he was raised from the dead and ascended to heaven, he was and he is seated at the right hand of the father. He is enthroned, as Ephesians put it, his work completed. So Jesus is king. He is absent, but in authority. And in the meantime, his servants, we are commissioned to serve faithfully, to be about his business. If you are a Christian, you are one of the 10 servants. Now let's just take a moment to compare this with what was about to happen to Jesus. You see, in less than seven days, a delegation would go after him and say that they did not want him to be their king. They had no king but Caesar. They wanted to crucify a man who was no king to them at all. You see, it is said that there are just two types of people in the world, disciples of Jesus or those who defy Jesus. Either Jesus is your king or he is not. Either in your heart Jesus is Lord of Lords or is not Lord at all, so the saying goes. And though we come across those who are apathetic towards Jesus, when you press them, Jesus has no place for sovereignty in their lives. Meanwhile, others are hostile, but whether overt or covert, either way, it makes a person an enemy of the king and his kingdom. The parable ends on a sober note. The enemies of the king are doomed to fail. Many of you know I've just graduated from theological college and at college I was part of a larger fellowship group with a number of students from around the country. Well, Louis from the Northwest was one of them. And I always enjoyed meeting up when we had a national gathering of students with Louis and others. But what I liked particularly about being in Louis' fellowship group was that when we came together for a quiz, there would be 30 tables of 10 students or staff. And if you had Louis on your team, you would always win, whether it was history, whether it was art and literature, whether it was science, general knowledge, the music round. He knew all the answers. No other table could ever win unless they had Louis. One writer puts it like this, it's a foolish mistake to oppose King Jesus. You will be thoroughly defeated for opposing such a pure and perfect and righteous King as Jesus. We are called to serve faithfully in his absence, to be about his majesty's service. And in Psalm 149, it records that the faithfulness of his servants brings delight to the Lord. How beautiful the thought of bringing joy to our Lord through our faithfulness. And this is set in a context of a king hating culture. I'd like to note the way one commentator so poignantly puts it. As the king's servants, we serve between the smile of Jesus and the frown of the world, and we must decide who we value most. Jesus, 
King Jesus is returning. Faithfulness is rewarded. And as we see in verse 15, the nobleman will come back and will reward those who have something to show. For the first servant, one miner has gained 10 more, and for the next, one miner has gained five more. Let's just notice their humility. They do not take the credit for it. They don't say, we have earned it but it has earned. In other words, we steward it, stewarded it, but it did the business. The minor, what, what is that? Well, there is some debate. Is it the gospel? Is it the spirit? I think Jesus is asking us to be faithful gospel entrepreneurs for him while he is away. Now, let's think of Paul, who came immediately after the time of Jesus. He said it wasn't his preaching or his gifts that won people for Christ, but it was the gospel, the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. And Paul, at the end of the age, when the king returns, when Jesus returns, He'll be surrounded, Paul will be surrounded by the multitudes who through his witness will have come to Christ. But he will stand before Jesus and say, it was your gospel that did that. Are we business minded for Jesus going about his business? Does Jesus get your working time or just your leftover spare time? Every gathering of Christians, every church has a mission statement. And at Christ Church, ours is to make passionate disciples for Christ. Yes, you may have an employer. You may be self-employed. You may be employed in a voluntary role, in a caring role, outside the home, in the home but you have a higher employer. We are to put the gospel to work, at work, in our homes. As parents, we are not just working for our family, but we are working for Jesus in our family. Do you have a business plan for the spiritual nurture of your children? It is each of our responsibilities as parents. We are given that gospel responsibility to teach spiritual things to our families. And single people, in all the diversity of opportunities that you have, are you working for Christ or just satisfying yourself? Or perhaps you are at a later stage in life are you still working for Jesus? I want to tell you that every week I receive an email from one of our centenarians to tell me how she is praying each week for our Alpha course. And I know that she sees her care home as her workplace, her mission field, a place to make passionate disciples for Christ a chance to tell the residents and the staff the good news of Jesus. If this is your priority, be encouraged. If you are about your majesty's business, through all the trials and difficulties of day-to-day -day life, and there are many, Jesus says there is a reward. But if today you can't say that he is your priority, we must take seriously the final two verses of the parable. The third servant says, here is your minor. I kept it wrapped up in a cloth. In that very statement, there is a contradiction. He is a servant for the king, but he doesn't work for the king. His excuse, as he says, and we see it in verse 21, 
I was afraid. You are a hard man. Well, in other words, I distrusted you and therefore I feared you. Do you trust Jesus? Notice how he trusts us. He trusts you to be about his business while he's away. In his earthly ministry, he invested in the people all around him. His invitation to be in the kingdom of God was and is to everyone. But we can exclude ourselves by our attitude or our behavior. How easy it is to be like that third servant. We don't have to be incredibly antagonistic, just disinterested, going about our own business, as though we hadn't been put on mission. We hadn't accepted the invitation of the king into his kingdom and to be about his business. Are we treating our faith in Jesus like an, like an optional side salad rather than the main event, the main meal, our daily bread? Have we taken the gospel for ourselves but are doing nothing with it, wrapping it like that third servant in a cloth and hiding it? And the king's response, the servant is judged as wicked and what he has is taken away and redistributed. Jesus wants us to understand the principle to the one who has more will be given, but the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. And it's debated whether this third servant is a Christian who has done nothing with this greatest of gifts given, or whether this servant is an unbeliever. But either way, well, it's bad either way if we are not serving the king. So now we come back with greater focus to that original question. Are you on his majesty's business? Are you on his majesty's service? Jesus the king is returning. And he has entrusted us in the meantime to be working whatever our work, whatever our circumstances, bringing the hope of the good news of Jesus. That he is our savior. He has set us free from our sins, all that separates us from Father God. And he has brought that to everyone everywhere. Are we about his business? Church, we have a mission statement, making passionate disciples for Christ. That is the business we are to be about today. Having heard God's word, we now affirm our faith in the words of the creed. We say this together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning, friends. May the blessing of the Almighty God be with you all now 
and forevermore. Amen. Philippians 4 verse 6 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we come before you desperate to be made whole. We lay before you now all our fears, anxieties and doubts. Take hold of us, indeed cradle us during these times. We long to continuously dwell in your presence where there is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. Forgive us for our sins, for the things we have done intentionally and unknowingly. When our tongues have spoken harshly to one another, we ask for forgiveness. When our actions have caused another to be hurt, we ask for forgiveness. Holy Spirit, keep our tongue from evil and our lips from speaking deceit so that we may love life and see good days. In all that we do, may our actions and works glorify our Father in heaven through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for our nation. May your mighty hand be upon your people, the shade that protects them from harm and the compass that guides them back to you. Your plans for your people are always good and never of evil. We beseech you in the name of Jesus, grant your children that promised future and hope. Many in this nation are wandering in a desolate wilderness without a physical and a spiritual home. Will you, Jesus, grant those without shelter a place to call home? And will you also make your home in their hearts? No longer to be like lost sheep, but for them to know the comforting voice of their shepherd to be known intimately by you and to follow you for the rest of their lives as disciples and children of a loving God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we lift up the leaders of the world to you grant them true wisdom from above and give them your servant's heart so that they may perform their duties diligently with integrity and love father we pray that they will not be consumed by power greed and self-ambition in all that they do may their service be to your glory Open their eyes and their ears to your truth. Holy Spirit, soften their hearts so that the seeds of your word will grow and produce much fruit in them. May you surround those leaders with men and women born again in water and spirit who will give godly counsel and we pray that through their proclamations the leaders of the world will accept Jesus as the way, the truth and the life. May the love and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ which surpasses all understanding be upon our government, authorities and monarch. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now let us take a moment 
to offer up our own individual prayers and listen to hear what God may be saying to us now, knowing that as we draw near to God, He will draw near to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. God bless you all. Hello and welcome to the Holy Communion part of the service and we're going to be using prayer D. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Almighty God, good Father to us all, your face is turned towards your world. In love you gave us Jesus, your Son, to rescue us from sin and death. Your word goes out to call us home. To the city where angels sing your praise, we join with them in heaven's song. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Father of all, we give you thanks for every gift that comes from heaven. To the darkness Jesus came as your light. With signs of faith and words of hope, he touched untouchables with love and washed the, the guilty clean. This is his story. This, this is, is our song. song. Hosanna in, in the highest. The crowds came out to see your son, yet at the end they turned on him. On the night he was betrayed, he came to table with his friends to celebrate the freedom of your people. This is his story. This, this is, is our song. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus blessed you, Father, for the food. He took bread, gave thanks, broke it and said, This is my body, given for you all. Jesus then gave thanks for the wine. He took the cup, gave it and said, This is my blood shed for you all, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. This is our story. This, this is our song. Hosanna in the highest. Therefore, Father, with this bread and this cup, we celebrate the cross on which he died to set us free. Defying death, he rose again and is alive with you to plead for us and all the world. This is our story. This, this is, is our song. Hosanna in the highest. Send your spirit on us now that by these gifts we may feed on Christ with opened eyes and hearts on fire. May we and all who share this food offer ourselves to live for you and be welcomed at your feast in heaven, where all creation worships you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours for ever and ever. Amen.
And as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. The body of Christ. The blood of Christ. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Now the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.
Thank you.